Oh, what a pleasure to be back here. And I knew we weren't be able to be here at eight because I knew once you guys got in there and started talking, you'd reminisce and build new friendships. Some of you guys are in groups with people you've never been with before, and I, some of you are old hats, so you guys just caught up really nicely. That's good to see. Um, I have been doing precepts for a while. I, th I was thinking this is actually my 12th year, so that that is a lot, but it, it honestly doesn't feel like much because it, it's been such a great addition. And to tell the truth, like I, I'm married with five kids and coming to Bible study on Monday nights, my kids were usually good with that because dad was home then and, and then sometimes dad would go and, and I'd be at home and that's fine. But when we'd both have to go somewhere, that, that was tough. Like we'd go out for a movie date and they'd be like, well, what, what, what happened? Like, what if something happens? Like, like I, yeah, it's going to be okay. We're just going to the movie. We'll be back in a couple hours. Promise me you'll be back. And I'm like, I, I, I'm like really sure I will be back, <laughs> but I don't feel like I can promise you. Like, I mean, I could get in a car accident. I could like, oh, shoot, I shouldn't tell them this. <laughs> but that idea of like promise, like can you make a promise and really have everything in control to actually ensure that that's gonna happen? No, like you can promise, okay, we're gonna have tacos tonight. And then, oh no, practice went late. And oh, I went to the store and there was no lettuce. And then I forgot to take the meat out. And I'll, okay, sorry kids, we didn't have tacos, things came up. And a lot of times if somebody has promised something to you and it doesn't go through, it's like, oh, it's okay. It's, it was like the heart counts, like they had a good intention. It doesn't matter if it like went through, it was just an intention to kind of promise. Imagine God who has control over every single element to say, yeah, you're gonna go and I'm gonna bring you back in 70 years. Like, are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure, it's gonna happen. Well, what if, what if like a, a king takes over and, and what if we're not the rulers? What if, like he 100% knows every car coming, whatever thing that could happen and he, can completely say a promise knowing that it will be fulfilled. So I think because we have made promises that we haven't been able to go through with, we've had other people make promises, we're just used to it. We can't even say, or even someone says a promise to us and we're like, okay, yeah, sure, like I'll believe it when I see it. So for us to trust that when God actually promises something, that he's actually gonna do it, we have to remember stories like this to be able to remember that he does do that. So I did make a nice little handout and I hope you have it. It's gonna have lots of slides and I really tried to be very clear to see what you're gonna be filling in in the blank, but that's gonna be our first uh, point is the promise fulfilled. So in the grace box there, promise fulfilled. And then I tried to underline the parts where the blanks are gonna be so that you can know exactly what to follow in there. So in Ezra, we read that in order that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord st stirred up the spirit of Cyrus so that it might be fulfilled. God knew exactly what was gonna happen he knew exactly when it was time. We even read to see, you know, 100 years before Cyrus is even born, before Persia is even a country, he said, called him out by name, this is what's gonna happen. He doesn't wing it. He, he knows it and he goes with it. So what does God say about our, his promises? So 2 Corinthians 1.20, for all the promises of God find their yes in him. I tried to find that, I'm always reminded of these songs, there was this song like, all God's promises are yes and amen, and then I'm like, I'm, that's the Friends song, like, <laughs> da -na -na -na. but, and then I tried to find, and then I found some other like, 90s hill songs, like just super high tempo of all the promises, so couldn't find that song, but that idea, and some people are chuckling because they maybe remember it too, but all God's promises are yes 
and amen. They are yes in him. They will be accomplished. So I want to just remind us some of, of some of the promises that God is giving us that we can remember as he did here that he will for us. And sometimes we wait. So the next verse here, 2 Peter 3, 9, reminds us that the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but he's patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. You see who he's actually patient towards? Not others, like, okay, you're saved and I'm just patient for everyone else to get on the bus. No, he's patient towards you. He's not slow, he's patient. Imagine that word now. I'm not slow, I'm patient, okay? We could all do that. So let's look at some other verses. And in these verses, let's um, highlight, if you've got a highlighter or underline, let's underline or highlight the promises that God has in store for us that we can take as promises. So Matthew 28, 18 to 20. This is after the Great Commission. Jesus says, go and all the nations. And he says, and Jesus came and said to them, the disciples that are there, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So what should we underline or highlight? What's a promise we can take from that? Yeah, I'm with you always, to the end of the age. I'm with you always. We are in this between age, this, this age after Jesus' death and before he comes again. We've been giving these marching, or, marching orders to go and make disciples and teach, and that's what we're doing right now. We're in his word, and we're, we're doing these marching orders. And that promise that he, he gives us is that he'll be with us until the end of the age. Okay, let's look at John 14, 1 to 3. Have your highlighter or pen ready. Maybe I'll just slow down when I've, I see a promise here. So let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. That's a promise, actually. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have not told you? that I go to prepare a place for you. It's a promise. He's gone to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. God fulfills his promises so our role is just to have faith, to trust that he's gonna do that. There's nothing that can get in the way of that promise being fulfilled. So we, reading these stories, remembering how Jesus was faithful in the Old Testament and multiple times and in the New Testament, to remember that God, if he says a promise, it's yes, it will be fulfilled. He's going to fulfill it. We have to have faith. Okay, so what, what is faith? Let's look at a couple verses of faith here. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So what is the promise there? You will be saved. I love languages. I love learning different languages and I love how you can learn a language and then you can see God in a different way. You can see how words connect that you may not know beforehand. So um, I know some people know Spanish so like the word for hope and the word for faith and the word for wait, K 
can all be sometimes used as the word esperan or esperanza or espera, right? To wait, to hope, to have faith. Like to, I never thought of waiting and having faith as being the same word. If you have faith, it's not right there in front of you, but you're just gonna wait knowing that it's gonna happen. So look at some of these words in this Hebrews 11, 1 and Romans 10. What are some different ways that faith can be explained? So we've got now faith. It's an assurance of things hoped for. It's a conviction of things not seen. It's something you can confess with your mouth. You know, sometimes you can believe it in your heart, but then to say it out loud, to confess it with your mouth, and to believe in your heart. I'm so thankful that, that I'm here and that, and that you're here and that many of us have faith and we are waiting for these promises to be fulfilled. But how did I even get to this point? Did, was, was I just any better than someone? Was I seeking God? But well, you can remember that it's actually none of us came to faith on our own. It was God who brought us, who called us, who stirred our hearts. So that's the next, next point we see. Prompted to act. I tried to do a bunch of like PR prompting. <laughs> When you think of the same thing over and over, you're like putting this, uh, all these words together. But the next one, prompted to act. So in Ezra 1, we saw in three different times that it said God sort of stirred the hearts. So who did he stir the hearts of? So God stirred the hearts of Cyrus to make the proclamation. And what an amazing, just from a pagan king, the praises he has to the God of Israel, it's amazing. He prompted or stirred hearts of individuals to go, to return, to rebuild, and others to give. So some of the people didn't go, but they, they stayed and they supported and they gave animals to help carry the stuff and gifts to say like, you know what, God has established me here in, in Babylon. I'm gonna stay here, but oh, I'm so thankful that you guys are going back and we're going to send you and, and I want to help give gifts to that. I remember when I, I, I before I got married, um, my husband and I, well, my boyfriend and I at that time, we, were, we both did a YWAM and we did it in separate places and I had no idea what God was doing in his heart um, or what God was doing in my heart. I just knew whatever it is, Lord, like, I, I just want to follow you wherever in the world you take us. And, and if you're leading Matt in a different way, if, if you want him to be a monk and celibate to you, Lord, I give him to you. But if you choose for us to be together, Lord, I want to follow you to wherever in the world you call us. And so when we met back together and we got engaged and got married, it was like, yeah, we are going to go wherever God calls us. And every time it's been... Abbotsford. <laughs> it's been stay here and work. And he brings people in front of us that are doing something that I'm like, oh, if I had another life, I would love to go on that boat, that mercy ship and go around and do that. It's like, oh, I can't do it, but I can support someone who can do it. And so like, oh, a little piece of me is going on there. And oh, this other friend from my YWAM, she's in the Amazon, like working with these unreached tribes and like translate, I'm like, whoa. Okay, I would love if I had another life, and I can't, but I can support her in that. And uh, these other people sharing these stories of, of what they're doing. And so we have a map at home that has little pictures of these people around the world that we've gotten to be able to, from Abbotsford, doing our work, be able to support and send out. So it's not that, you know, we do see these people listed and we see them as the faithful ones to like get up and go and rebuild. But there were people that were faithful, that were left behind. We'll see in a little bit that 
Esther, the story of Esther, is the people that did not go. So there's still God was moving in those people as well too. So let God stir your heart. Don't feel like it needs to be a certain way. You don't have to be the one that's going, but let him stir your heart and be faithful to that. But the greatest stirring of any of our hearts today is that one that would bring us to salvation. So let's look at some of these verses that remind us of that. John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And now we've got some more promises. And I will raise him up on the last day. God is the savior. He is the one that saves. He's the one that draws and calls and softens our hearts and drags us kicking and screaming from the kingdom of darkness and transfers us into the kingdom of light. It is his work that does it. And for me, it was important to see and be reminded myself that it's God's role to save and it's our role to pray. There are people you know that are not following the Lord, people you love dearly, family members, friends, and you just wanna just convince them about what God is doing and like, look at how real this is. And when you're reading this and it's coming to life to you and you just wanna like share it and they're just like, hmm, coincidence. Or if you're like, come on, like a hundred years before Cyrus was born, like how is that possible? And it's like, meh. It's foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the glory of God. He's the one who softens and brings hearts. So if you have someone in your life that you love and want so dearly to come to the Lord, don't spend your hours writing out your five questions that I would ask, or these are my apologetic pieces of how to win an intellectual argument with them. Pray, pray. Just God, you soften heart. You are the one who calls. You are the one who stirs the hearts of a pagan king to do your will. Help me to remember that my salvation didn't come from me, but it was you. You are the savior. So let me pray. Sure, God has drawn me to him and I'm, I'm saved, but I'm not perfect yet. Neither are you. And so we have Philippians 1, 6 to look at. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So what's the promise there? He will bring it to completion. Yeah, he began a good work in you. It is a good work. And, you know, I was thinking about that again. You look at words, okay, esperanza, wait, hope, faith, good work. He's got a good work in us. What about a work good? He's working us to be good. We're not good to begin, but he's doing a work good to make us good. And in that end, at the time when Jesus returns, it will be completed. We will be good. We will be sanctified. You probably heard that before, that we are being sanctified and we are sanctified. God is doing that work and it's a good work. So God's role is to do the good work and our role is to then let him, to let him chip away and make you become more patient or not slow, uh, to work on things that could be that. So what can be our response? Romans 12, 1 to 2, the other side of the page here. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God what is good and acceptable and perfect. So I got to do a little Zoom meeting with um, the Zoom group. So hi guys, you're still listening. It was nice to talk with you and go over the, the lesson of this week. And one of the things that we talked about was the part when we looked at burnt 
offerings, burnt offerings, burnt offerings, burnt offerings. And just like what that meant to them, that that was restoring worship, that, that those sacrifices, to be able to do that there was their act of worship. And so here, our response, what we can do is to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our spiritual act of worship. So it's a continued work. It is a continued, continued thing to not be conformed, but to be transformed. And that's what you're doing right now. We're, we're renewing our mind and we're discerning what the will of God is by studying here together. So I'm so thankful that you're here and that you're doing this. So just continue to let God do that work in you. The next section, my favorite chapter out of this section, Ezra 2, just a list of a bunch of names. I, I, I honestly, I'm going to try to get you to, from now on, that you change and enjoy these things too, because I, I'm saying that this one is personnel recorded. So we had promises fulfilled, prompted to act, personnel recorded. So what I'm getting you to like say, you're making like this new promise um, that in the future you're going to look at lists of names like this. So you read, you know, Genesis 7 and it's like, and they begot this until this age and had many sons and daughters and then this and that. Or you, you read these lists of names in Matthew or when you see a list of names or a bunch of places that you have no idea of what exists, I want you to remember that when you read a passage with names and places, well, I put it in the first person for you guys, unknown to me, I will be encouraged to know that the Bible is true and authentic and that God is personal. So when you see names of places or people, it isn't once upon a time in a place far, far away, there was an old man and a wolf and the whatever. It, it's in this town, at this year, there was this family and this person. We even um, looked at, I don't know which verse it is now, but uh, in the list there was, I don't know, I'm guessing like 18 or something. It said, the other Elam. <laughs> like in the, it's just like, it, when someone's writing a book, they never use two people's names as the same. Like, oh, the other's John, and then there's the other John. And there's like, no, you, you create new names. You see a repeated name, it's like the other Elam. To remember that these were real people. This is true, this is authentic, this is a real history of real people who did things. And how great is that to know that our God is personal. He doesn't see you guys as just a crowd of people here on Monday night. But he, he would say, oh, who was there on Monday? I'd be like, oh yeah, there was like, oh, like 50 people. Oh, who was there? And then I'd be like, oh, and there were like my former students, and there was like that person, and there was that person. He would be like, and in the front row was blue and blue, and then this person was here, and this person was here, and they were there, and they brought their Bible, and they brought 13 pens, and they brought all the, like, <laughs> you look at like the, the counting and the details, God knows it all. And we don't worship a God who just sees us as a crowd but he's a personal God and we have a personal relationship with him. Let's look at some verses that remind us of that. John 10, verse three. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Revelations 3, 5. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments. That's another promise. Going to be wearing white garments. We don't have to worry about what am I going to wear? <laughs> we'll be given something. It'll be white. And I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Imagine being in heaven and walking in and you're amongst the crowd 
and the angels and God are like, who's that? And Jesus confesses your name. What do you, that is Barbara. <laughs> this like confesses your name in front of God and in front of, the, she is meant to be here with me. Your name, fill in your name. That's, you are meant to be here. He will confess your name before the Father and before his angels. There's another promise in Revelations that I'm like, that's just very mysterious to me. And it's for those that are overcome will be given a stone and on the stone will be a name written that only you and God knows. That I don't, it's not Don Goslin or Don Tyson Nee Goslin. It's gonna be something that I'll just be like, that's my name. No other Alum. It's gonna be that's my name and only my name. And you will be fulfilled in that to know that God is personal. Then we get to chapter three. Priorities made. Oh, we're going with the P's. So we got promises fulfilled, prompted to act, personnel recorded, and then now priorities made. So a very good thing to see is that God's discipline worked. And how about this for alliteration? To refine and refocus the returnees. <laughs> We know, we, we researched to see why they were sent into exile anyway. It was their disobedience. They uh, had other gods. They had other idols in Israel, like Baal and Ashtoreth, which was like the god of like finances and like money and prosperity and sexuality. And they worshipped those gods, and that's who they gave themselves over to. When you look at why did they not give the year of Sabbath rest... I don't know, maybe they wanted more. Like, look at how bountiful this is. Oh, my word, if we pay, the, we're going to make so much money. So they never took that, that year off. And they were disciplined for it. One of the things I was reading about that or, or listening to someone speaking was um, God got his Sabbath years. You either pay me now or you pay me later, kind of the idea. He'll say, I want these years from you. And it was for their good. Like, take a, a year off to not work. Spend time with your family. Spend time with me. Relax. Remember that it's me who provides for you. Like, how good that would be for their mental health. But he, he cho told them to do that for their good. And they said, nah, we're not going to do that. It's like when you go to get your car fixed and they're like, okay, just buy this, you gotta change the filter on this thing. I don't know nothing about cars, so change the, the, this filter. And then you're like, oh, no, I won't, it's like $12. And then you go on from it and then your whole engine block breaks. It's like, okay, you could have paid now that small thing, like it's for your good or you pay later. Either way, I'm getting it. And um, the pastor who was sharing this was encouraging us to say, like, so even if you even think about your own finances and like, I oh, know I should give this, but what if I kept it? And, and then you keep it and then you see something breaks down or some other bill comes up and it's like, it's going to get it regardless. But he's asking us to do things for, for our good too. So it worked because that all being said, um, there are, in Jerusalem, if you were to go back there, you can see that there are burn lines in the rock of where the first, like in this five, I'm really bad at numbers too, I'm sure someone was like 586 BC, that first, the burning down, when, they, when Nebuchadnezzar came and burnt it all down. And then there's the one of the 70 AD, when the Romans came and burnt. And they can excavate the rocks there, and underneath the 580 pre-Nebuchadnezzar stuff, there were tons of idols. Idols and gods, they found them all the time, little things of idols. But in this range, there weren't. So God's discipline worked. They came back and they said, we're gonna do things right. 
you saw that right away when, when there was the one person in chapter two that didn't have the records and they're like, ah, well, you can't be a priest, you lost your records. Like they could have just said, too bad, you can't prove it, your fault. But they said, we're gonna consult the um, 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 thumb, um. <laughs> That, that's, we're gonna ask God. When we have the priest set up, we're gonna ask God, do we accept him? And if God says yes, whoo, brother, you're in. There's, there's no doubt about it. We're gonna have God make that decision. So we can see that it worked. They, they were refocused and returned. So they did um, have a change in their heart and they were more obedient. So we can look at what did, what did they do? The very first thing. Before they built the church to build the altar inside to worship, they built the altar on the ruins. They built the altar first. They restored worship. Restored worship of the God who disciplined and the God who saved them. I bet some of you had this song in your mind this year or this week, Boney M. By the rivers of Babylon, <laughs> where we sit down. Because that was exactly that. If somebody put up your hand if you sung that song this week. Yes. Okay, so it's like, how can we sing these songs of Zion in a foreign land? They, they were told, they were by the rivers of Babylon and people saying, oh, sing us those church songs. Like, how can I sing that song when I'm here, when I'm away? But then they returned, they built the altar, the singers and the priests were back in the role that they were given and they're singing and trumpets and cymbals and worshiping God in Zion, remembering that he brought them back, he disciplined them, he was good to discipline them, and he saved them. But we need to remember that sin always has consequences. There was consequences. That temple would never be as grand as it was in Solomon's day. That temple was burnt down and it would never be. There was consequences to the physical building because of their sin. You know, some people will ask me, like, is it true that all sins are equal? I'm like, well, yeah, all sins are bad and they are unholy and they separate us from God and they require God's forgiveness, but there are a whole wide variety of consequences. So you can say, yeah, sure, well, murdering someone and lying. Okay, they're both sins, they're both against God, but to murder someone, now you've got to do your time in prison and you have to be haunted day and night of the people you affected and the family members and the this and that, like those are consequences that are gonna go with you. So students of mine, especially ones that have been raised in a Christian home that are probably nominal Christians but not there yet and, and they wanna know like, so is it okay, can I do this, this and that and still go to heaven? Or is it okay if I do this? Or why don't I just do what I want and then later like I'll become a Christian when I'm like 60? Um, like, can I do that? And it's like, yeah, you know, you hear stories or they say, how unfair, like the one person, like a guy at the, his deathbed accepts God and he gets to go to heaven and like, how unfair. Not when sin has consequences. And we actually, in living with God and being in God's word and, and in the good work that he's laid out for us, we can actually experience joy and love and, and this great stuff right now. It's not for his good, it's for our good that he gives us these guidelines. And when we go outside of those guidelines thinking that this is gonna be better for us, it will always have consequences. So, that people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of people's weeping. So we see this end at this worship service where some of the people who knew what the old temple looked like and they knew that it wasn't as good, they were weeping, weeping over their sin and the discipline that they needed. 
and others were just worshiping, Lord, oh my word, I cannot believe you brought us back. It feels like a dream. And I've often thought, if you were to bring someone to church for the very first time, never been into a church, maybe they're an international student, never been into a Canadian church, and let them look around during a worship service. And they're looking and they're seeing some people are crying and some people are smiling. And they're like, are, are these people happy or sad? I don't, I don't know what's going on. But we too will weep and worship. We will weep and mourn and be convicted of our sin. And then we will praise God in the grace and the comfort of his salvation. So we've talked about the word of the Lord being like a double-edged sword. Every time you read it, it convicts you of your sin, but it also comforts you to know that, yeah, you're a sinner, but I've brought you to me. So that mixing of weeping and worship to come in this way. Let me pray this summary prayer and then we will have a song to close us off. And you can weep or you can worship. You can do what the Lord calls you. So I've kind of put them all together in a summary prayer here. So let us prioritize to learn God's promises from his word, which he will fulfill May he stir our hearts to know and love him more personally. And let us worship him in spirit and truth, being convicted of our sin to weep and transformed by his grace to praise. Amen. Lord be with you.